All right, the Theocast guys here talking about Left Behind, a conversation on eschatology. And here they're talking about dispensational futurism. And so it appears that they've left dispensational futurism behind. But what have they replaced it with? And what about this issue of the Bible codes? That's what we're going to talk about. Bible codes. What are the codes of the Bible? Is there a Bible code? And if so, what is it? And how do we decipher it and all that stuff? Let's listen to Justin. He can say it better than I can. Right. This is one of the things, too, because in that dispensational framework, there's this fear driven thing, but there's also a lot of charts and stuff, you know, about trying to predict. And, and you know, we're going to chart out when Christ may very well return based upon a very sort of codified kind of like, let's crack the code in Daniel and let's crack the code in Revelation and let's figure out like, what these weeks are and what this means and, and you know, all of this stuff. Uh, and then we're going to insert you know, like half a week here, and, and that means a long time. And um, there's just lots of things, right, that, that are there. And But we're going to try to figure out when the world's going to end and when right. Christ is coming back. And Well, that's that's something we, we, we don't know, is when the timing of the second advent is. We do not know. Uh, but we are given a, a sort of prophetic code book, if you will, in, for example, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, so here, Daniel said, and what does he mean, obviously, by code book, code, you know, or, or cracking the Bible code or whatnot? Well, he means interpreting symbolic Bible prophecy, okay? Uh, biblical prophecy presented in symbolic form, symbolic language. See, Daniel saw a dream and visions. So these dreams and visions, that's what they're talking about when they talk about code. And in this particular vision, in Daniel chapter 7, he sees four great beasts come up out of the sea. Now, look at the first one. It was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Now, I've never seen a lion with eagle's wings on it in real life. This is not obviously a real life situation here. This is symbolic of something. These beasts symbolize something. And then you got a second beast, like a bear, raised up on one side, three ribs in its mouth. A third one, like a leopard, with, again four wings of a bird on its back never seen that on an actual leopard before the fourth beast it just says terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong and it had great iron teeth and then I, out of this fourth beast comes ten horns and then this little horn would arise but only after three of the ten were plucked up by the roots and then this horn was a mouth speaking great things this is the antichrist this little horn is the antichrist Okay, we see more attributes of it later on in the chapter, verses 24 through 25, for example, verses 11 and 12. Uh, we see the little horn throughout Daniel chapter 7. But this is the basic outline. Now, now, how do we interpret that? How do we interpret that? Let's go to uh, my What Rough Beasts. Okay, What Rough Beasts and the Antichrist. That is the little horn, of course, Daniel chapter 7. Now, the little horn, according to to futurists would will be a single solitary individual human being like Damien from the movie The Omen. Okay, that's that's futurism right there. And he only comes on the scene uh, after a mythical pre-tribulation rapture and during a mythical seven-year period of, uh, of great tribulation. And this is why this is why you have to break down the five main false teachings of the dispensational futurist eschatological system. One, a pre-tribulation rapture, which is they assert. <clears throat> is a temporally separate event than the second advent. That's false. They are the same event. First Thessalonians 4 is the parousia, or the second advent. It's also the resurrection of the saints, and also the rapture, the harpazo, the catching up or snatching up of the saints into heaven. That's all at the second advent. So there is no temporal separation of the rapture from the second advent. They're the same uh, event. And then, of course, uh, pre-tribulation rapture followed by a seven-year period of tribulation and Antichrist will arise during that time. All this is false. All this is false. So that's how you approach that. But here, then you got the preterist view. Teaches Antichrist was a single solitary <clears throat> individual human being. Either Nero in the first century or Antichrist was a series of pagan Roman emperors who persecuted the Church of Christ in the first few centuries. So the Antichrist already came before the Roman Empire ever fell. So we don't need to worry about Antichrist anymore. Both of these systems hold false views of Bible prophecy. So let's go down to the 
Let's go down to the interpretation here. Daniel 7. Four beasts. What are this what what is these what do these symbolize? You see? The four beasts parallel the four metal man elements of Daniel chapter 2. So I have that in parenthetical here, the head of gold, chest and arms of silver. That's from Daniel 2. But here we have the beasts, and these are empires. These are not single solitary individual human beings. These are empires. Again, Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian Empire followed by the Roman Empire after the fall of the Roman Empire. By the way, when was the first advent of Christ? The first century AD. In this hyphen time period. Okay? Symbolized by the legs of iron of Daniel chapter 2. So once the Roman Empire falls, 476 AD, now we're entering into the feet, uh, the feet and toes of iron mixed with clay from Daniel chapter 2. So the ten horns are not a future conglomeration of 10 European nation states out of which the Antichrist will arise uh, in what dispensational futurists will call a, quote, revived Roman Empire. Well, first of all, the feet and toes of iron mixed with clay indicates that the Roman Empire never truly left. Even in its collapse and fall in 476 AD, the Roman Empire would continue on this remnant of iron from the Roman Empire would continue on all the way up until that stone smites the metal man image on its feet in Daniel chapter 2. That indicates and represents the second advent of Christ, not the first. Because the first advent came at this hyphen period. So, the ten lesser tribal nations that made up the Roman Empire after its fall in 476 AD, the Ostrogoths, Burgundians, Vandals, Heruli, Visigoths, I have the list here. But notice, is this code? Look, we're interpreting the ten horns as this. Okay? That's how we're interpreting. You know why? Here's noted 18th century Reformed Baptist theologian, scholar, biblical exegete, and historicist, Dr. John Gill, who is contemporaneous with Jonathan Edwards. Uh, John Gill was over in, the, uh, in England as opposed to Jonathan Edwards in the colonies, American colonies. But he writes in his commentary, Ten kingdoms which sprung out of the Roman Empire. That's what is represented by the ten horns out of the out of this kingdom, the Roman Empire, are ten kings that shall arise, or ten kingdoms. John Gill recognizes correctly that kings and kingdoms are used synonymously in Scripture. Charles Hodge will point out the same thing in the 19th century in his volume three of his systematic theology book. Okay, or into which it was broken and divided upon the dissolution of the Roman Empire in about A.D. 476. He gives Mead's list, very similar to mine. He gives Sir Isaac Newton's list. Sir Isaac Newton was very into Bible prophecy. Okay, uh, I thought it was just awesome. He loved the study of Bible prophecy. I looked, and this horn made war with the saints. So the little horn did not arise until after three of these ten horns were plucked up by the roots. Three of these would be plucked up by the roots. Let's go down to that. What were the three? The Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. 493, 534 AD, 538 AD. This is all after the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, these three horns were all Arian, too. They held to the Arian heresy of church history. It's a Christological heresy. Uh, it needs to be understood what Arianism was and the main uh, the, the heresy that it was. The Arian heresy versus the Catholics, and Catholic, of course, meaning uh, literally universal. But in this context, we're talking about the fact that they were Trinitarians as opposed to Arians. All right. And the Vandals and the then the Ostrogoths were uprooted before the Little Horn. That is, Papal Rome could rise to power, this Little Horn. Papal Rome. The Papacy. Okay, a mouth speaking great things. Here we have an interlude of a heavenly vision here. Fiery flames, wheels were burning fire, fire issued, streams came out, a stream of fire. Judgment, the books were open. This is all about judgment right here. Then again, uh, the great words that the horn was speaking, uh, they were all burned with fire. So that's judgment. Here's the ascension of Christ into heaven. He came, uh, he came to the Ancient of Days. He, he came uh, with the clouds of heaven. He ascended up to heaven in the clouds of heaven. See Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The ascension of Christ into heaven. To him was given dominion, glory, kingdom, all that. So this not pass away, not be destroyed, everlasting dominion. All the other dominions of all the other earth beasts 
you know, the beasts on the earth, beasts that rose up out of the sea, but they are earthly. That's an earthly vision versus this is a heavenly vision. And look, look at just, just an interlude here real quick. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, says the ESV. And the visions of my head alarmed me. And in fact, this word alarmed is actually means like anxious. It, it, made, it made me anxious right here. But this was anxious. My spirit within me was anxious. If you look here, it, uh, let's see, I think it says sheath. Yeah, see, my spirit was, was within its sheath. My spirit within its sheath was, was digging was digging this anxious uh, if you look at the word there it, it means a di a hewing out a digging out so my spirit in its sheath was digging into me okay that's kind of that's more of a literal type of interpretation but that's what he means it bothered him daniel had uh, mental health issues <laughs> because of this okay because of these uh visions that he saw and look at the other, but I, but I, I still desired, I still desired to know the truth. It didn't matter if my sheath within me was digging at me. I was anxious. I was alarmed. Uh, it didn't matter. I still desired to know the truth about the fourth beast. Doesn't matter how scary it is. You keep going. You keep going. <clears throat> and about the 10 horns that were on its head and the other horn that came up and before which three of them fell. This horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Until the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given for the saints the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. That'll happen at the second advent. Because this horn, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, let's see if, I don't know if I have that. This horn, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Oh, is that all I have? Oh yeah, I only have that. Okay, uh, Second Thess, yeah, way down here. Okay, I gotta scroll through all this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <laughs> You can tell I'm a techie, right? Totally. Uh, no, I wish I was much more of one. There we go. Second, that. Oh my goodness, that was way down. The coming, the second advent. That day, the coming, the second advent. Unless the apostasy, falling away, or departure from the faith comes first. Man of sin, son of perdition, be revealed. Man of lawlessness, son of destruction. You know what is restraining him now? That is the Roman Empire was restraining the little horn from rising to power. The Antichrist. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. His coming, his second advent. So this Antichrist will uh, continue all the way up until the second advent. The coming of the lawless, lawless one is by the activity of Satan. Revelation chapter 13. Okay, It's Satan who gives him his power and great authority. I don't know what I, oh, 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, see, I, I'd have to go all the way to, where do I have Revelation 17? Or Revelation 13. No, I got Revelation 14. That's right. <clears throat> so, so many places we could go. Uh, but again, this is all code. This is code. Three ribs in its mouth. Likely refers to the, of the Medo-Persian Empire, the three main uh, conquests of the, of the Medo-Persian Empire, namely over Lydia and over uh, Babylon, of course, and then over Egypt, over Egypt, okay, which is not something Nebuchadnezzar was able to do. Nebuchadnezzar was not able to go all the way and take Egypt, okay, but uh, the Medo-Persians were able to take Egypt. Uh, Egypt and uh, and then of course the conquest of Alexander the Great after that the leopard Hellenization of course was very uh, important for the early church but uh, because the New Testament was written in Koine Greek not Latin even though it was written under the uh, suzerain empire of the Roman or Latin Empire but yeah, so Bible code stuff, very important. So 14 minutes, I'm not, I'm going to cut this short just because I want to, I just wanted to get to the point. Yes, the Bible has a code and Christians, we should know about it. We should understand these things. It used to be Protestants of the past used to know these things. These were just standard teachings. But now people either want to ignore it or vie for some dispensational futurism or preterism with post-millennialism or something like that. And then uh, these guys are amillennialists, I think. So uh, we got a problem there too. But their own confession, 
their own confession. Here, 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. This is chapter 26. Okay, chapter 26 of the church. Notice what this says. Right? But the, the, the Pope of Rome cannot in any sense be the head of Christ's church, but rather is that Antichrist, that man of sin, son of perdition, that exalts himself in the church against Christ. The text says, who exalts himself in the temple of God. Here the confession authors rightly recognize that what Paul means in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 by temple is not the temple that was standing when Paul wrote it and not some future rebuilt temple. Okay? That Paul meant temple, uh, what he meant was the church when he said that the Antichrist sits in the temple of the living God. That's the church. So that's a correct interpretation of that. And all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Coming. So the preterists are wrong because the Antichrist will continue all the way up until the second advent. That's why the full preterists or hyper preterists are far more consistent than the partial preterists. The partial preterists can't, they have nothing to stand on, really. They're, they're, the, the ice under them is very thin. So, uh, but that's it. So, because they were talking about confessions and, and the Confession of Faith, 1689 Baptist, Con well, that's, a, that's an historicist confession. It's not a preterist confession. It's not a futurist confession. It's an historicist confession. And that's what I've just uh, laid out for you. That little horn that arises after the fall of the Roman. Here's Jonathan Edwards. Real quick, Jonathan Edwards. This is his volume one of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, works of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, History of Redemption. The time when the reign of Antichrist began, it is certain that the 1260 days or years, years, which are so often in Scripture mentioned, yeah, seven times. Twice in the book of Daniel, five times in the book of Revelation. This 1260 days, 42 months, time, times, half a time. They're all the same time period. All the same time period. And it represents years, a literal 1260 years. Mentioned as the time of the continuance of Antichrist's reign, the little horn, Daniel 7, the sea beast, Revelation 13, 1 through 10, did not commence before the year of Christ, 479. And what Edwards means is, it did not commence, the 1260 years of Antichrist's reign did not commence before the fall of the, of the Roman Empire, but after it. That's what he means. Look at how he tears apart Rome all through here. After he claimed the power, uh, the Pope, okay, Bishop of Rome, claimed power of a temporal prince so that he was wont to carry two swords to signify that both the temporal and spiritual sword was his. That has not changed. The papacy still claims that. They still hold the two keys, the temporal realm and the spiritual realm. You was used to be called God on earth. All this stuff. Jonathan Edwards, look at, look at. See how all this agrees with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin, son of perdition, Daniel 7, the little horn, Revelation 13, 1 through 10, the sea beast, Revelation 17, the scarlet harlot. All speaking of the same entity. Okay, Jonathan Edwards knew it. John Gill knew it. The authors of the Westminster and the 1689 Baptist Confessions of Faith all knew it. They were all historicists. And they all bro broke the Bible code, if you will. Okay? They all knew it. This was stuff that they were all teaching. So I would highly recommend people go back and look at some historical theology on this issue. Church history and historical theology. And start listening to to the men on whose shoulders we all stand as Bible-believing Protestants or evangelicals, whatever you want to call us, Bible-believing, Bible-thumping Baptists, if you want to, <laughs> right? Reformed Baptists, how about that? We're Reformed Baptists, but we recognize the, the value of John Calvin, do we not? Or Martin Luther before him and the bondage of the will, forget about it. That, that work is, is standard. Martin Luther's the bondage of the will is standard for the Reformation, in the study of the Reformation. So much that he says in that book. So, uh, anyway, so we should stand on the shoulders of those giants in order to see more than they did, but we can't see more than they did if we won't be even willing to stand on their shoulders. You know, it's it's like they're cry this great cloud of witnesses and Jonathan Edwards and the, 
the authors of the 1689 Baptist Confession. Of Faith. It's like, it's like this great cloud of witnesses is, if it was their ability to do so, uh, are crying out saying, get up on our shoulders. What are you doing, church? Get up on our shoulders. Stand up on them. It's okay. We can stand on their shoulders. They would want us to, my friends. They would want us to. Okay? But that's, I'm going to leave it at that because there's so much more we could go into, but it's already, yeah, 20 minutes already. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Post your comments down below. Let me know what you think. Talk to you soon. Soli Deo Gloria.